Welcome, welcome to Ask the Expert. My name is Alicia Orsini, and I am the president of Women in Film and Video of New England. I'm so excited to have everybody here and to have this conversation today with you. We're going to be hearing from our experts, Maria Geis and Micah Koopa Edwards, Mika Koopa Edwards, uh, all about women in film as a celebration for part of Women's History Month. So I really want to thank everybody for who uh, is joining us today, including our leadership circle and the Ralph Lowell Society members. Uh, we really appreciate your continued support because you're fostering conversations like this, and that's really important to all of us. So before we get started, there are some people behind the scenes who are helping us with the event, and I'd like to introduce you to one of them right now, uh, Kira, my colleague behind the scenes. Hi everyone, um, I'm Kira. I will be hanging out in the Q&A. We wanna hear all your questions today. So in order for you to ask those questions, we ask you to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and be, be sure to ask, be sure to let us know where you were tuning in from when you were asking your questions. Um, if you see a question that you want to hear the answer to, be sure to vote up for it by clicking the thumbs up button. And thanks everyone. We hope you enjoy today's event. Great. Thank you so much, Kira. Uh, we have another feature new to us, which is closed captioning. So if you're looking down at the bottom, uh, click the live transcript button on the bottom of your screen um, to the, there will be little, two little things that pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript, which is a sidebar window where you can see what each speaker is saying. So just bear in mind that the closed caption does have a slight delay, but hey, that's an option for you now. So uh, if you would like to use it, you can. All right, it's time to introduce our speakers. And it is my pleasure to introduce both of these women. Um, the first is Maria Geis. She's an American journalist, screenwriter, and director, a member of the Directors Guild of America. Maria led the battle for gender inequality in the film industry. And she's now the subject of three recent books, two award-winning feature films, This Changes Everything and Half the Picture. She is the groundbreaking activist on behalf of women directors. Maria is currently co-producing the feature documentary Brainwashed, Sex and Power, The Visual Language of Cinema, and is attached to direct the feature documentary Women on Wall Street, which I'm really excited to hear more about. And uh, the narrative feature, Oliver Out Loud, which is a story of a painter with Tourette's syndrome. Maria, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. I'm so pleased to be here. Thanks. Wonderful. All right. We got to bring in Mika. So Mika is a film and television producer with the vision to unite and empower the world's diverse diasporas through the connective and enlightened power of media. Power of media, people. Uh, prior to her foray into film and TV production, Mika established a 15-year multinational marketing career leading global teams and brands some you might have heard of nike pepsico cadbury just to name a few she created sole entertainment which is a vehicle that taps into the power of media to elevate create talent creative talent from the global south in asia africa latin america the caribbean the middle east cultures and parts of the world that are yet to be fully empowered, appreciated, appreciated and understood. So prior to launching Soleil, Micah also served as head of marketing and strategic partnerships for Creative Chaos and worked on the critically acclaimed documentary, This Changes Everything, executive produced by Gina Davis about discrimination against women in Hollywood. Thank you, Mika, for being here. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, I know that we're going to have lots of questions. So for our audience, don't forget to put things right into the Q&A tab, vote up other things you see. Hey, tell us where you're tuning in from, but also tell us if you work in the industry or not. I'd love to hear that. So Maria, I want to start with you. Um, of course, we all are women working in the film industry, but I would like to give the audience a little bit of background about why this is a battle. And I think we know that women's inequality is a battle in general life. But why in the film industry, and especially the work that you're doing around the EEOC, could you give us a little background? Well, I think the most important thing to understand is that 80% of the entertainment media content that's distributed around the world is created in the United States, is created in Hollywood. And that is a tremendous amount of cultural influence. So who is telling the stories is really, really important. And traditionally, women have been shut out. We've been excluded from being able to participate in that. You know, women have been directing about 4% of studio features for a really long time. 
However, extraordinary change has happened recently thanks to the ACLU campaign for women directors in 2014 um, and the EEOC investigation into systemic discrimination against women directors in 2015. Um, we have seen uh, a tremendous, tremendous change. I mean, I think those rocked the industry entirely and really kind of set the, the groundwork for speaking out, which then resulted in Me Too and the exposés in Weinstein that you know, resulted in a huge amount of change. But the EEOC, which functions in total confidentiality, um, is hard to track in terms of how influential their work has been. However, it's pretty clear that they filed commissioners' charges against every major institution in Hollywood, agencies, studios, networks, unions, um, and in 2017. And it was right after that that we see this extraordinary rise in female hires. I use the numbers, the statistics for women directors because those are kind of the storytellers. And I think that women director, directors in general are kind of the, the, the guide. So we went from horrible, horrible numbers um, to 130% rise in 2019 um, in women directors of episodic television and about a 600% rise in women directors of studio features. And um, the numbers in, in commercials is not uh, recorded, but I know for a fact that it's been revolutionary. So, um, so we've seen a huge, huge rise in the number of female directors. We still have work to do, there's no question about it, but we have to realize that there is a tremendous amount of opportunity right now African-American directors are directing 18% of television, which is beyond their demographic. It surpasses their, their demographic in terms of population in the United States, which is incredible, is so fantastic. Um, Latinos um, still way below at 6%. Asians are at par with their population at um, 6%, 7%. Latinos at 7%, Asians at 6%. Um, and so um, there is you know, work to do, but we have to think of the fact that these numbers came out in 2019, which is the same time that we had massive you know, industry closures because of COVID. And now a year later, you know, here we are in 2021, and we're moving into a terrain that all of us are trying to figure out. The streaming giants are, you know, really, really powerful, a tremendous amount of, you know, uh, content coming out in terms of, of series um, uh, television. Um, but we don't really know what's going on with indie features. Um, it's very, very difficult to get them off the ground with very high levels of of uh, money you have to pay out for insurance and so forth. So I think we're all dealing with questions and, and you know, sort of a, a, a mysterious terrain that we have to move into together. And uh, um, that's it. <laughs> well, um, Mika, I know that we have seen a change in the producer landscape as well. And you have a perspective from not only having um, done film work, but also in the marketing spheres as well. Yeah, um, and film and TV, I think, you know, it, it's very different, you know, in terms of um, the producing structure, right? Because on the television side, you're dealing with networks and, you know, even if you're an independent producer, you will still have to interface with producers on the executive level at the network, you know, at the network itself. Um, and then on the marketing side of it, branded content um, being an industry that's just, you know, kind of ballooning and there's a lot happening. There are advertisers trying to be filmmakers, they're filmmakers now doing commercial work and bringing their filmmaker lens to commercial work. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's a very dynamic um, uh, shift that's happening on that side. Um, but what I would say on the producer specific aspect of it, um, Directors are definitely the creative leads of every project. A producer, though, has to project manage from beginning to end, right? And, you know, a lot of people don't understand that nuance. And so it's the producer's role to, to find financing, right? 
and there are different types and levels of producers as well. So the start sometimes could be a bit misleading, particularly when it comes to producers, um, because this, you know, the, the statistics for producers, 3% in 10 years is, has been the delta um, for producers of the top 250 films. And so now it's up to, I think, 16, I think it's about 30%, um, you know, up from 27% last year. So, you know, 3% in one year is great versus 3% over 10 years to 2019 is, you know, but it's still 3%. <laughs> right. And it's going to take us, I think, overall for all these behind the scenes roles combined, it's going to take, and that's, you know, directors, producers, cinematographers, it's going to take us about a decade and a half for us to get to parity, at least. That is assuming that that 3% um, growth rate <laughs> stays the same, you know? Um, so there is a level of concern, I think, among female producers. And I would even speak to my personal perspective as a black female producer, because, you know, that doesn't even factor in the intersection of race into that, right? Um, and, you know, so, a lot of the focus is on female directors, which is which is definitely fine. But I think the, the the broader kind of systemic look at a systemic problem and how all these things interplay is very important. And then even when you do see the growth on the producing side or the director side, any one of these that we look at in silos, at what level, particularly for producers, because a lot of producers can make up the numbers at below line levels, as opposed to being a principal producer or creative producer, right? And those are the or executive producers, which have the, it, have the power to really influence who the director is, right? Who, who, who is hired in front and behind the camera and kind of what that representation needs to be top to bottom. So, you know, there's a lot there. Um, and so there are different, I think, issues facing each kind of function within the industry that deserves a much closer nuance look than just the statistics. That's a great point. And then I have a, a great question here as well from Laura. What is the number for Native Americans? I seldom hear them mentioned in these discussions. And I know uh, from, uh, from a local level, because I personally live uh, near the Mashpee Wampanoag tribes, I know, I know that group of filmmakers. But from a larger scale, do we have any numbers of the Native American population of who's doing film work? Um, well, let's see. Let me start by saying I have a little, little, tiny, tiny bit of Nipmuc <laughs> and Native American <laughs> heritage, which I've, uh, you know, really always been very concerned about that population. They aren't even included in the Directors Guild of America statistics. So what you have is the pie is <laughs> sliced up between, you know, um, in, when you just look at women, you know, Latino, African American, and Asian, and then you have a little tiny one is, you know, unknown, and that's two. Mm. Um, basically, um, the answer to that question is they are off the map. They are, wow. you know, not there. And um, it is, you know, one of the most important areas of, of concern for us. I mean, there's no question that Latino numbers are way below where they need to be. The numbers of women are still below where they need to be in general, but Native Americans, that is a place to put an enormous amount of, of emphasis going forward. I have another question here from Trisha. Um, how do the numbers of female filmmakers in Hollywood, American independent film compare to other geographies such as Europe, Asia, et cetera? Mika, do we have an idea of how that looks compared to everywhere else? Yeah, I don't have this, these statistics, um, but I do know that there's a lot more representation um, in Indian films, specifically um, in Bollywood, um, there's an article that Forbes um, did, I think maybe two weeks ago, um, talking about how women in Bollywood are treated um, in Nigeria. They, the majority of, of their film industry is independent. Um, and there are quite a lot of female directors um, and producers as well. Um, the difference comes in a lot when it comes to pay parity, um, which also exists on, you know, on the Hollywood side of things. Um, but, you know, it's, it's definitely more disproportionate. Um, pay parity and especially representation on crews um, 
you know, and behavioral discrimination as well, harassment, um, you know, that type of, of on, on set experience, um, there's some significant issues there. Um, you know, speaking from the Caribbean perspective where, where I'm originally from, um, there are quite a few female filmmakers um, as well as there are males, um, but financing is an issue across the board but it still tends to lean much heavier to the male filmmakers um, within that, that sphere. So a lot of the issues are the same, you know, um, and these other industries haven't been tracking or re reporting to the level that Hollywood has. Um, so there's some, some catching up to do in terms of the statistical analysis there. Um, but, uh, you know, I could say, you know, from our experience, so they, we, we interact with a lot of different filmmakers around the world, producers do co-productions as well. And, you know, a lot of the issues are very much the same. Mm. Can I add to that? Yes, please. I just, I just want to mention, you know, the issue of identity politics and the, the issues of race and ethnicity that are so, you know, profound here in the United States. Well, you know, in China, the majority population is Asian. In India, the majority population is Indian. In Latin America, the majority population is Latino. And in Africa, you know, African, Black. And so, um, you, the, the, those in the industries that exist in those places, and some of them are really burgeoning, you know, and, and you know, developing an enormous amount of content, um, don't have those same issues. I would say that gender is, you know, a, you know, a real issue in, in all of these places. But in the United States, we're really very focused on, on a, you know, our, you know, melting pot, you know, country and identity politics where these, you know, we really have to examine these carefully. I want to go ahead and remind the audience that uh, to use that Q&A tab, ask us your questions uh, about filmmaking or anything else you might want to know um, about our wonderful experts today. And I do want to um, turn uh, back around a little bit and talk about both of your entries into filmmaking. How did you become filmmakers? How did you get into this world? Uh, Mika, let's start with you. Yeah, well, my, my entry into this world was, was very different from most, I would assume, um, because I spent, as, as Alicia mentioned, I spent most of my career in corporate marketing, um, which I think would have been a great foundation in storytelling. You know, that's a storytelling school in itself, right? But it's very commercially focused, of course, um, and there's a, there's a limit um, to how deep you could go, how wide you could go with a story and, and how far your ideas could, could evolve, right? Um, and so that felt, uh, after a while, um, felt like a bit been there, done that, been around the world, <laughs> cue the song, you know? Um, and I really was seeing what was happening in media and decided that I wanted to, to be a part of it. And specifically coming from the Caribbean um, and Trinidadian identity kind of having a lot of different cultural influences interwoven into it. I, 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 the representation of us and, you know, places that we descend from um, as people of color around the world is sorely lacking. And so I decided to go study the industry, go back to school um, after a long corporate career, study it. And that's when I started actually doing producing work in London and further decided to, to launch my company when I discovered a lot of these alternative industries to Hollywood, like Nollywood, like, like Bollywood, and saw how huge they were and how much of that content isn't being seen in the West. Um, and so that's why Soleil exists, you know, um, that's, that's really been the story to now. I love that. You know, if we could have a whole other conversation about, like you mentioned, Nollywood, Bollywood, all the other places that are creating things. So we'll put a pin in that one. But Maria, <laughs> Maria, tell me, how did you get into filmmaking? Well, let's see. I grew up in Puerto Rico. My father was um, starting up an oceanographic institute there uh, when I was a little girl. And um, I really think it began with my love of dreaming. I was just fascinated as a little girl with dreams. And so when we moved uh, to Provincetown, Massachusetts, actually Truro, um, and my father was back at the Woods Hole Oceanographic, 
um, there was this wonderful movie theater called The Movies in Provincetown, and they played the most fantastic um, movies, you know, really European movies primarily. And so um, I just felt like when the movie opened up on the screen that it was the closest thing I had seen to, to a dream. And I just fell in love with filmmaking. Um, when I was a young teenager, about, I don't know, maybe 14 years old, I saw Lena Wertmuller's Swept Away. And I saw Lena Wertmuller's name come up on the screen. And I, that really inspired me as a, you know, a, a young girl, a teenager, to see a woman's name. And um, I hadn't seen a lot of them. And um, I just thought, I want, I want, I want to do that. So uh, when I graduated from uh, Simons Rock and Wellesley College, I, I applied to UCLA Graduate Film School and started making shorts. And um, I never turned back. I, I, I just loved it. So when I began to, you know, hit a wall in terms of employment, of course, my class at UCLA was 50-50 women, thanks to Title IX, um, Equal Opportunity for Women in Education. Uh, but when I stepped off into a professional playing field, uh, I, it was very, very hard to, to get a job. Even so, I had early success in the UK with my first feature film, When Saturday Comes. Um, but it became very hard um, to continue my career uh, in Hollywood. And we, we can talk more about that as well. Um, I do want to answer a couple of questions that we have in the Q&A. And um, Marissa actually writes, uh, how do you pick a team? How do you find your film composer, an audio engineer? How do you put your team together? Maybe just talk a little bit about how you find your people. Well, uh, Mika, would you like to... Start yeah, I, sure. Yeah. Um, so from a pro it, it, it really does depend a bit on whether you are the owner of the project um, or you are hired in, you know, to a studio project and you are just staffing, you know, a certain aspect of it. But from our perspective with Soleil, um, from a top line perspective, the first lens that we punch is what is the story? and who are the right people to tell the story and what culture and what community is the story centered in and making sure that there's representation as well as skill set from top to bottom in front of the camera behind the camera so it typically will start out with kind of your above the line you know your core kind of lead team which will be your producers, um, and that will be, you know, who you will be the principal producer in this case as kind of the originator of the IP. You would hire your line producer, your 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 lead producers, etc. Also, the director selection is very important. Now, there are times when the director will bring the project right to a producer. Um, the director might also produce themselves, right? Um, some do that. Um, but if you are to be the one selecting the director, it then becomes who is the right person to tell that story? What work have they done? And or sometimes, you know, with female directors in particular, if they don't have the same amount of experience as a male director, it becomes looking at their potential and looking at what their gaps are, what they want to learn, um, and the type of, you know, culture that they come from is really important to us, um, and building a team around them to help them to evolve and to grow and to, to, to kind of get to the next level. So that's really important in how we look at, at, at the core team. And then from there, the producers, the line producers especially, they would hire what we call the below line crew, right? Um, so that could be your cinematographers, um, it could be you know your audio folks, um, other associate producers, um, people who will work in the field, et cetera, et cetera, your editors and you know all of that. So it's very collaborative, um, which is important, right? And it's usually a, a, a mutual decision that the director and the producer has to come to um, that balances the creative and the business as well. Um, and then you you know you build out your crew from there. But but for us specifically, it's very important for us that our crews top to bottom reflect the story um, and the communities are represented that are being spoken about in the film or, or the series. If, if I can add to that just a little bit, 
I mean, you know, uh, you know, as a filmmaker, as a director, you know, hiring your crew and getting your producers on board, you know, is absolutely key. It is, as Mika says, you know, the incredibly collaborative and a director is only as good as their, as their, you know, crew is behind, you know, behind the camera and in front of the camera. Um, so typically you'll hire, you know, producers, you bring them on board, but then you're going to get a line producer. If you're doing a shoot in a different country or a different place, for example, they'll bring the keys, you know, the, the your, you know, cinematographer, your DP, and they'll hire all their crew and you'll, you know, pick your production designer and they'll bring their crew. So the keys will then bring in the crew. Um, one of the big problems for women in, in our industry was that there was really no access. You know, we, we didn't have the internet. We didn't know how to be in touch with each other. We didn't have much of a community and we didn't know how to hi hire women. And his men were just all over the place, um, you know, doing everything. So one of the extraordinary things that have happened, again, since the ACLU and the EEOC investigation and all of this um, momentum that's happened for women in Hollywood, um, these organizations have cropped up. There's Glass Elevator that was started by my friend uh, Jen McGowan and um, Women in Media, Tema Steig. Um, they're, uh, both of these have, and there are about five other um, or, uh, online organizations that have below the line networks. So you just log on to these and you can find all your crew positions and you can crew up your entire film with women. <laughs> um, so, yes. yeah, so there's a, really a lot of access and um, availability of information that never existed before. You know, organizations like Film Fatals for, you know, women directors, you know, women make movies, women in film, you know, uh, uh, New York, women in film and video, and of course our own, you know, uh, women in film and video, New England, which Alicia, uh, Alicia heads up, Alicia heads up. <laughs> um, uh, they, you know, all of these um, are great uh, ways to, um, uh, you know, get your crew going. And um, so Marissa, since you've asked the question and you're in Somerville, definitely come and check us out over at Women in Film. Uh, we have a directory where you can go and find all women for every time of Cruel Base. And I see another question here from, I think it's Kiara, um, where are the events that you can network in Go over to wafvne.org. You can see our list of events. Uh, and she also says, thank you, GBH, for bringing these panelists together. Uh, she's been in LA for 19 years, and now she's back here, Boston-based, and she's really appreciative for this conversation, which is great. Um, I have another question uh, that's a little more uh, in-depth, and this is a, we're going to talk about pitching now, which is, you know, it's, it's tough. Uh, so from Cynthia, she's writing, I've been pitching my screenplay series to producers on Stage 32 and in tip for years. My series is adapted from four published novels. Um, she's worked with a screenwriting consultant and producers respond. It's not so great. Um, you know, they're seeing the struggle. Um, then they pass and they say, it's hard to sell a period piece. I mean, pitching is so hard on so many levels. Um, they're telling her things like you need an award-winning novel. Some of that's true. Some of it's not. Some of it's, what, what, is, uh, what is the deal with pitching? How is the best way to do a pitch? What do we think about stage 32? Um, Mika, let me start with you for pitching. Yeah, um, very, very important question. And it's, it's something that I think there's never really one answer to it. Um, but just from that example that was given, um, it's very important to, when you're pitching your story, to visually bring it to life right? Even if you haven't shot anything. Um, so if you have that, that, that screenplay um, or synopsis or, or whatever you have written, it's still important to, especially if you're speaking to investors and other producers, you know, create a pitch deck that basically, you know, or a series Bible in the case of a series that will give you the full arc of the story and pull visuals that would really bring to life what the world is that you're trying to build, um, particularly on the narrative side. And this goes for unscripted and for scripted. Um, it's just the, the, the content input is a little different. Um, what I have learned um, is that some proof of concept is important and helps you get over the hump 
um, versus just going with an idea. And there are two things that 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 benefits you um, down the road is that if you have a proof of concept before you take it to that bigger producer or that bigger production company or even a financier, you would have put some of your own resources in. Now, the big question that comes there is, okay, I need money to shoot a proof of concept, right? And there it becomes, you know, pitching to financiers and trying to, or, or, or just friends and family who might be able to help you crowdfund um, your proof of concept and allow you to kind of get, get that visual idea that you would then have more ownership of as you progress through, you know, the life cycle of the project. Um, I, you know, I, I believe that that pitching is always about selling more than the idea. It's selling the 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 gap in the industry, the gap in storytelling. You know, making sure you say why is this important, why is it urgent. Those two questions have to be answered in every pitch. Otherwise, people will just pass on it. It's just another period film, or it's just another comedy. So you have to kind of make that argument um, for all of your stories. Why is it important? Why is it urgent? And then build that world for them to see. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> What's your take on pitching? So great, Mika. I mean, pitching is an art. And, um, you know, you, you, what you want to be sure you have is ownership of, of your material and um, you know that it's timely, and that you can you know get it down into you know what they call a little elevator pitch. My friend Kaya Alexander has a a, a little pitch tutorial called How to Pitch Anything in One Minute. Um, KayaAlexander.com. You can find it K A I A Alexander.com. Um, but if you go online, there are all kinds of tutorials in terms of pitching. I think the most important you know, aspect of it is that you're passionate about it and that you get it to the right person, that you're pitching to the right person. So you, it, it doesn't help um, if you, um, you know, have a fantastic project and, and you're not um, uh, you know, getting it to, to you know, the person who really can take it the distance. So um, yeah, I would, it's an art and there's a, a, lot of, a, lo a lot of good material on how to improve your pitches online. Can I um, chime in on that point there? Because that's a really important point, um, finding the right person, right? Um, where is your story centered? Why is it important? And who would care about that particular topic? Who will care about that world, right? Because at the end of the day, even though people are making business decisions, it's still rooted in emotion, right? And they have to emotionally connect to the story that you're telling. Um, a lot of times, you know, I get approaches by, you know, different people who work with Soleil and they, they're like, oh, we have, we have an investor that, you know, wants to see all your content. I'm like, who's the investor? Where are they from? <laughs> have they invested in films before? What appetite do they have for the risk that comes with investing in, in, in film type of projects versus if they were investing on in stock, you know, um, those things are important to know. And you have to vet the people that you are pitching to just as much as they are vetting you because you are the owner of the creative and your creative is valuable. Don't let anybody make you think that they're doing you a favor. You're bringing creative assets to them. So you have to vet them. Um, and make sure that they are the right people to give this gift of your story. I love that. <laughs> I just have to say, it is a gift. Also, it, you know, it often feels like, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I got to get to this to Netflix. I've got to, this to HBO. I mean, the fact of the matter is today with the advent of the internet, we have a, an infinite number of distribution, you know, uh, platforms that we can uh, distribute our material on or, you know, get things, you know, moving forward on. Um, so it's just, you know, vast in terms of the different places that you can get financing. It's not just producers, it's not just studios, it's not just networks. I mean, you can go to foundations, philanthropists, uh, you know, there's a whole vast array of, um, of different ways that you can approach this and special interest groups. You know, if your content happens to, you know, meet the needs of a special interest group, well, that's a great way to go. So there are all kinds of ways to, 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 to get things going. 
Absolutely. Um, I want to take a break here for a minute. Um, we've got so many great questions. I'm going to try to get to all of them and kind of put a few of them together. Uh, and thank you. Keep them coming. But I do want to take a moment to introduce my colleague, Jamie. Jamie, welcome. Hello. Thank you, Alicia. I have loved today's discussion. And I want to thank our audience at home for spending some time with us while we ask our experts, Maria and Mika, about their experiences in the film industry. It's been just fascinating. Um, you know, viewers and listeners turn to GBH for many reasons, whether it's to learn more about the film industry, to hear our fact-based journalism, or to simply be entertained for a while. So if you think GBH is worth listening to, worth watching, and worth supporting, then please make a donation. For a limited time, if you're able to give $5 a month as a GBH sustainer or $60 all at once, you will receive this drama mug as a token of our appreciation. It's right behind me, you'll see in the background. Um, have fun and show you appreciate a good drama with this cobalt blue 12 ounce ceramic mug. One side reads, my life is full of drama. And the other side says, and so are my nights. I just can't get enough of my favorite dramas. This is really the perfect mug to add to your collection, whether you're a producer, a fan of our masterpiece series, um, or just an entertainment buff like me. So please visit gbh.org slash support events to make a donation in any amount. Again, to qualify for the mug, we need $5 a month or $60 all at once. Every dollar our donors give enables GBH to continue producing virtual events like this one on a wide range of topics year round. Simply click on the support link in the chat tab now or text GBH to 800-492-1111 using keyword GBH to make that donation, 800-492-1111. Audience support helps GBH get the shows and virtual events you enjoy on the road and in production. Your support is vital to our strength. So thanks again for joining us. I'll be back at the end with another message. And now I'm going to send it back to Elisa, Maria, and Mika. <laughs> thanks, Jamie. I have to tell you, um, so, I'm, I'm a PBS girl growing up in an MTV world. And I can tell you uh, when I was younger, you know, when you're young and they say uh, you got to memorize your phone number. Uh, I didn't have my phone number memorized, but I did have the pledge line for GBH memorized 492-1111. Getting a mug, getting, and, and, and I could get the mug for $5 a month or $60 is one I'm time. Impressed. <laughs> yeah. I have, I've had that number stuck in my head for my entire lifetime. Anyway, I do want to say that thank you, Jamie. Uh, the support of WGBH does allow not only these conversations, but, um, you know, Masterpiece, all the documentaries we've seen. We're going to talk about more of that stuff, but I have so many questions I want to get to. Um, I have a, a one or two rapid fire questions um, for our guests before we get back into some of the deeper conversations. For Mika, um, Elaine wants to know, where did you go to school for producing um, and what was the male female breakdown? And also for Mika, um, where did you go when you went back to school? And what was, uh, was your education helpful to your career? And I'm interested to hear Maria answer this as well. Right, so as I mentioned, I didn't go to school. I didn't go to film school. So I actually did my undergrad at Howard University um, in international business and marketing. So that's where my marketing foundation came from. And I went into corporate America doing marketing. When I decided to make the career switch into media and go back and study media, I went to the London School of Economics, um, which was ranked at the time number two in global media studies, which was very important to me. Um, and, you know, the reason that it was impactful and it proved itself, you know, to be directly related to why I, why I decided to, to, to create Soleil is because it helps you understand the full, not, not just what is and how to go shoot something, but it helps you understand the full system and the theoretical aspects that allow you to critique the industry at a certain level. And that still proves very, very useful 
um, you know, and all the way to the granular level. Um, and so my thesis was in Nigerian film um, and how it penetrates the Western diasporas, um, particularly black audiences and how intersectionality and black identity kind of affects their ability to do that. Um, so yeah, I mean, those two experiences, Howard, um, as well as LSE, really come together every day <laughs> as a producer because you have your business side, you have the industry side, and then from the creative aspect, a lot of my learning was practical, you know, working with production companies before launching out into building this fully. Um, so, yeah. What about you, Maria? Um, let's see, um, you know, I went to UCLA Graduate Film School, as I said, which was at that time a five-year program. I started in 1989, graduated in 1994. Um, I had 50%, uh, basically 50% women and 50% men in, in, in my class. Um, and I had an absolute blast. I mean, I loved film school. I had so much fun. And UCLA was a really, really great place to go. Um, when I graduated, it was Francis Ford Coppola who handed me my Master of Fine Arts degree, shook my hand, and he said, good luck. And that was about it, <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, that, that's the thing about film school. It doesn't really help you make the transition from, from film school to profession, especially for, for women at that time. And, um, you know, I have long thought that it's really important for us to figure out ways in, in entertainment media to intersect Title IX, which is equal uh, opportunity for women in education with Title VII, equal um, employment opportunity, because there's absolute, there was absolutely no you know, coming together. It's like you step out of you know, film school where you were equal, at, even though you were studying a totally white male um, curriculum, white male films, but still you came out in equal numbers and then you, you know, hit a playing field that was vertical literally. I mean, there was just, you know, nothing there. So I really found that, um, you know, it was much better in terms of moving into the profession to, to you know, launch out um, on, on my own, sort of like you were back at ground zero as if you hadn't gone to film school at all, except that you had these films that you brought with you. So film school, you know, kind of forces you to make you know, these, you know, professional short films. Mine did really, really well. I got a feature film before I even graduated with my master's degree, I got a $2 million feature film in England. That was very, very lucky, um, but that was you know, not thanks to film school. So I wouldn't necessarily <laughs> recommend film school, except that it's really fun. And, and, um, and you, you know, it does force you to, to, to create you know, content that, that you can then take with you. But I think it's better to you know, get into the industry and find a mentor and um, you know, observe, you know, intern, find jobs, move, you know, get under a spigot, find a place that's paying you money, you know, get, you know, um, so that you can be safe and not living in a, you know, on the street or in a one bedroom apartment for 30 years. <laughs> and I would say, especially if you want to be a writer or director, um, start making things. Mm, Don't yes. wait on someone to hire you to make something, right? Start writing. You might not know how to actually write, you know, a script in, in, in the full, you know, you know, three arc structure and the whole thing, you know, like start writing stories and then you will get the training, right? To, to, to morph that into kind of what's acceptable for the industry. But the story is really what's most important. And I think storytelling has changed a lot, right? Like it has become very much, you know, no longer that traditional tr three act structure as I spoke about. It's more like, you know, experimental, right? And people are redefining what these formats look like and what these genres look like. So there's a lot of space to, to kind of start with a blank slate and write the ideas that you have um, and start to shoot the ideas that you have. The next birthday gift you ask for, you know, should be a camera if you want to be a director and you start developing what your lens is and what your point of view is behind the camera. I would suggest that too. Absolutely. Also, as Mika was saying a little earlier, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, an incredibly collaborative uh, profession, you know, filmmaking. So networking is really, really important. Uh, there, uh, 
it's, you know, really um, an industry of reciprocity. I mean, that's a one huge reason that, um, you know, sexual harassment and abuse, you know, um, in, on, on the job was such a profound problem because it's, you know, sort of, I'll do this for you, what will you do for me? And very often women didn't have much to, you know, to, to trade. But it's really important and never has there been better opportunity for, for us women because of the advent of the internet with the access to people. We never had this kind of, of access to people in the industry that we do now. We can read about them, we can contact them. Um, it's getting in, getting in touch with people, you know, uh, developing, you know, a group of film, filmmaking friends, a team, being loyal to those, to those friends uh, on the long road. Um, so yeah, it's um, networking and be, you know, really being active about, about creating, um, you know, a very, very strong collaborative network is crucial. I have two questions up here that I'd like to kind of bounce off of what you're saying, Maria, um, which is um, from, from Laura. Um, sexual harassment is one of the biggest barriers to women rising in the ranks. Do we think it is? Um, so many have dropped out of positions because uh, they were quite good at what they do, but they couldn't handle the sexual harassment or those pressures. So I want to pair that with, you know, is sexual harassment really as big a deterrent, but also... Um, there was another question here too. Um, more like, is it is it the EE, is it the legal battles? Here it is. How uh, Melissa writes, how important is it creating change through legal means, uh, cultural gender representation? How can we change both through the means? So what are the deterrents? Is it, is it, I mean, I, I assume it's both, but how big does sexual harassment play as versus opportunity where, of course, then we had to um, go to the ACLU uh, and the EEOC? You know, if Mika, if you don't mind, I'll jump on that one. I mean, I, I really, you know, <laughs> have not been as interested in sexual harassment and abuse as I have been in employment of discrimination. It's like, give me the job, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I think that what many people didn't realize is how sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace is a symptom of employment discrimination. You know, it's the result of power imbalances in the workplace. And it really comes down to employment. I think it was very, very convenient for Hollywood to move this whole conversation. The EU, ACLU did all this work, the EEOC doing all this incredible work. And what did Hollywood do? You know, they, they didn't want federal oversight. They created CAA, created Time's Up. Uh, Steven Spielberg's partner, Kathleen Kennedy, created the Hollywood Commission. These are, you know, the Directors Guild of America, very keen on, they're all very keen on voluntary compliance. You know, I was very strongly calling for the need for, you know, an objective, impartial oversight body, a, a commission that was not inside Hollywood. But Hollywood ran away in the news media and Washington, D.C. They were all very, very happy for the whole conversation about employment discrimination against women in entertainment media to turn into um, everything about sexual harassment and abuse because that put movie stars, it was like a feeding frenzy. It was like somebody took you know, buckets and buckets, you know, helicopters full of chum and threw it, you know, into a reef and all these, you know, ecosystems, you know, gobbling it up, you know, greedily, everybody pursuing their own personal interests. You know, what I was fighting for was collective change, you know, and so, you know, what equal employment opportunity is about and what the battle for equal uh, jobs for women is about is a redistribution of jobs from men to women. And that's what Hollywood didn't like. Right. I would, I, I would definitely agree with that. Um, I guess the question then remains in the meantime, right? Until we get to that employment parity and, and, uh, and you know, sh balancing the power structure, what needs to be really put in place. And to your point, Maria, that's objective, <laughs> right? Um, because a lot of these so-called policing organizations are self-policing. How do you police yourself, right? A lot of these organizations are run by, you know, the same power structure, right? Um, uh, Anita Hill did a report, um, the Hollywood Commission report that came out in December, I think. And it said that, more than 65% of the respondents still believed that harassment and bullying 
was still a major issue. And in most cases that they experienced it, that there were bystanders who did nothing about it. Mm -hmm. So the, that goes back to the power structure, right? You know, even if people see it, do they call it out and is it treated with? And I think it's still very per pervasive. The sexual harassment specifically, I would differentiate from bullying, which is just as bad right? Um, but a lot of the focus, to Maria's point, has been on the sexual harassment. But, you know, bullying is still a very, very pervasive thing that because it's not sexual doesn't mean it's not a form of harassment. And I think that's a, a, a very important distinction that gets lost and that ignores a lot of the bullying tactics that happen in the industry. I want to circle back. Um, I want to get to a couple more questions since our time is running low. Because <clears throat> um, so uh, to to that point, like you see, discriminate microaggressions too. Like, can that woman carry that camera for eight hours? And to answer a question earlier, I uh, was a steady cam operator early in my career, and I was the only steady cam operator in my class. And then you know moved on from it because, to be frank, I had a hard time. But there are other discrimination issues. And I have two questions here that I want to get in here and talk about. Sonia writes, there's so much talk about underrepresented groups, such as creatives of color, women, uh, creatives with special needs, desperately wanting to have a seat at Hollywood tables. How is it important for our guest filmmakers to constantly wait to be invited or getting inclusion methods or practices or creating a table for yourself? And I want to add on, Lillian also talks about ageism. So there's not only discrimination in look, sexuality, age, um, uh, abilities. How do we how do we break through, or wait to be invited, or create it for ourselves? Um, I just packed a lot in there for you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I might need to circle back a little bit. I, I I wanted to say that I really feel that you know with me too, um, and you know in addition to you know, the advent of, of cell phones being absolutely everywhere, ubiquitous <laughs> and on, you know, on set, um, that it's much, much harder. And I, I mean, I think, you know, people, men and women are on notice about sexual harassment and abuse in the workplace. And I think it's very much more easy to out people and to expose sexual harassment and abuse. We see that people are losing their jobs, are, their careers are being destroyed, are they're, you know, losing money. Um, I think we've made an enormous amount of advancement in, in that way. Um, so I, I, you know, would love to, you know, really try to move the, the dial back to employment discrimination and, and the issue of, of women and money. I mean, I just read in the New York Times that $10.8 trillion um, is lost by, or not lost, but is not earned by women for their unpaid labor around the world in three times the value of, of the ent entire global tech industry. So there are a lot of enormous national and global problems where money is concerned. And so I just really want to, <laughs> to, to say that, that that to me is where, where the emphasis needs to go. Um, but getting to the issue of the table, I'm going to defer to Mika because I can't remember quite what you were, <laughs> um, <laughs> how that was, a question was playing out. Um, I can, I can touch, well, Mika, go right ahead. If you need me to reiterate, I can. Yeah, let me try to reiterate just to remind all of us. Um, I think what the question was, was, is it, is it that we have to wait to be invited? How do we break in? Right. Yes. Um, or do we create, like set our own table? I'm in the camp of setting your own table. Um, I think there's an opportunity to do that now because content is so, you know, content is king right now. Everyone wants content, right? What we have to figure out is how do we pool our resources? And this is not just financial resources, but intangible resources and have solidarity with each other to create together and to build together ecosystems right, that are interdependent, right, because it has to be a systemic approach to it um, in order for it to move the needle, right, and, you know, I'll give you an example for Soleil, like, what we have is we have film, we have TV, we have branded content, we have editorial as well. Our podcast that we launched last year is really 
a, a, a case study um, for us to put forward what our mission is while we create the, you know, the, the, the longer form type of content, right? And in doing so, we're giving the platform to the very creators that we want to work with, right? And the types of creators that we want to work with. And that kind of opens up the appetite um, for people to be curious about their stories and curious about their work and, and, and want to hire them as well. So, and that then kind of, you know, so we all have to come up with ideas of how we could pool those resources um, and allow each other to rise together. And I think when we get confronted with the barriers, it's very important for those who are on the inside to open the doors for those who are on the outside. And I think women, we have an opportunity to do better. Um, uh, people of color as well, um, to do much better there. And you know, the ones who are outside, we need to speak up about that and hold other women and other people of color, if you belong to that community, holding each other accountable to that. I need to uh, take a moment as our time is running short and bring Jamie back in to remind us about why your support is so very, very important for these kinds of conversations. Jamie. Thank you. Um, so I just want to reiterate to everyone that financial support from our donors, that's viewers and listeners and event guests like you, you know, really makes opportunities for gathering and connection possible at GBH. We're here for you, but we need you to please be here for us. So today, like I said before, if you donate $60 as a sustaining member um, in $5 monthly increments or $60 all at once, we would love to send you this GBH drama mug as a token of our thanks. Um, it's so easy to do. Just click that chat link to be brought to our site or text GBH to 800-492-1111. That's 800-492-1111. Maybe you'll memorize it like Alicia did. <laughs> um, so now more than ever, everyone, your commitment makes a difference. We're, we're so happy that you could join us. It would be even better to have your support. If you are a GBH member, thank you so much for your continued support. And... Uh, and now back to Alicia to All close right. the event, I guess. I guess we're running out of time. That was a we're fast hour. We're running. This is such a fast hour. Um, let let me um, say a couple of things here, but um, I have a great question. Uh, well, first of all, um, we have. Uh, I'm going to say it wrong, and I'm so sorry. I think it's Sean, and I'm probably butchering it. From Meath, Ireland, who's tuning in, and she asked the question, "What does your dream project look like?" And then Jessica is writing to us as well. So it says, "What is um, what brings you the most joy?" So dream project, most joy. Think about that for a moment, and I want to let everybody know that yeah this hour flew by so I want you to follow up with both of our filmmakers so make sure that you check out their website someone is going to drop them in the chat but also uh for I know we have some questions about the tax incentive and other things that are happening here in New England um I want to let you know that from women in film and video of New England for women's history month we are offering you 10 percent off our membership uh it's it's $50 a year, so you're getting 10% off. Just go to our website and use code GBH and become a member of Women in Film. Um, you can also ask me any of these questions. Um, I'm sure our panelists today would love to, to follow up with any of you, but um, I do that we could really be here for like three hours talking about all of this, but I do want to end on a note of joy. So uh, dream project and what brings you the most joy? So Maria. Um, dream projects. Um, I feel like I'm kind of working on my dream projects right now. I mean, I think the Nina Menkes film Brainwashed is just incredible. It's about the, uh, the uh, visual language of cinema and how um, images of women um, um, from the beginning of, of the industry, 1896, until today, you know, have resulted in images of sexual harassment and, and abuse and, un, and employment discrimination in society. I love this project. It's financed by Tim Disney, Abigail Disney, and Susan Lord Disney. Um, and we're very close to finishing that. And we're working on the Women on Wall Street documentary, which we're moving toward women in global uh, cinema, which I'm really excited about. 
And um, yeah, I would just love to get on another, uh, you know, narrative feature film and um, make that anywhere in the world, um, preferably with Mika. <laughs> <laughs> that would be awesome. We've been trying to do that for a while. <laughs> um, dream project for me, that's a tough one. Uh, I wouldn't be able to pick a specific one, um, but I would say that uh, I definitely want to tell stories of Caribbean heroes, you know, people like um, Trinidad's, like one of Trinidad's prime ministers who was very controversial, his name is Patrick Manning, recently deceased, you know, um, and, you know, through, through those stories open up a lot about our politics, you know, and our way of life and all the different intricacies of our societies. Um, musicians as well, like, you know, our music is just so important and it travels around the world. And there's so many stories be behind these musicians that aren't being told. I would, I would kind of put that as kind of the big, you know, the big kind of bucket that we haven't quite cracked into yet. And what brings me most joy is working with my team um, and working with the creators that, particularly these Global South Diaspora creators who um, they really light up um, when they work with Soleil because it feels like home to them and it opens up a world to them of, of access and opportunity that they may not have had before. And that really brings a lot of satisfaction. That's wonderful. I have to tell you that for me, my joy has been talking to you wonderful women. Today's a special day for me because it's March 12th, which is the Girl Scout founding birthday. <laughs> and my dream project is to one day do a film about Girl Scouts. So I'm just putting that out to the universe with you ladies. I'm just going to say, um, <laughs> thank you so much Love again. That. Thank you. Thank you, everybody who's uh, come on and watched uh, our team behind the scenes. Again, everybody who's watching, do connect with us. Do connect with our fabulous filmmakers. Um, Maria and Mika, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks so much. Everybody go enjoy the sunshine. Have a great day. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.